Or is that taking it all too far? During January, they were widely recognised as national heroes. Six months on, they are launching their own fight with the state government, demanding a 16% pay rise. The rank and file is just at the end of their tether because the uh, pay rise has been going on for t uh, two and a half years at least, and even before that, the only uh, increase the firefighters have had in this state in New South Wales is the uh, CPI since 1983. The New South Wales firefighters say in some cases they're being paid up to $130 a week less than their counterparts in other states. We are one of the worst paid firefighters in this state. We're at least $100 a week behind any other firefighters. The brigade began its wage rise campaign two and a half years ago with little success. Now it's threatening industrial action if calls remain unanswered. According to the union, the bottom line is simply the Fay government to get their act together and address our uh, demand because uh, they're going to have problems on their plate. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. Identity is still the leader, Mr. Untouchable, emerging out of the pack with a good run, could be the danger, and Spring Theme is joining in strongly. Spring Theme over on the outside, takes the lead with 100 metres left to go. Spring Theme in front, close to home, and is going to win it. Spring Theme is first, Ferret coming home well to get second. I think Scalero... Spring Theme home first, Gary Harley's tip, Scalero finishing third. Another handy trifecta payout of $1,534.60.
Willie O'Neill in the cap and Nepean's Brad Morfitt tied last year's championship after rain forced the final to be cancelled. Morfitt lived up to his top ranking in the first set with a 6-3 win over O'Neill. But the number two ranked Nova Castrian fought back in the second to win 7-6. O'Neill, who's about to embark on a four-month stint on Asia's satellite circuit, continued his momentum in the third to earn a 6-3 win and the final. In the women's final, top-ranked Bernadette Marshall from Tugra showed the form that helped her win a US Open junior singles title. She took the first set 6-3 and the second 6-4. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Nesca House on King Street was originally built and owned by Shortland Electricity. It's a classic example of Art Deco architecture. It's absolutely a delightful example of Art Deco buildings um, and it's, it's as good as any Art Deco example in, I guess, Australia. Newcastle University now owns the site. It's commissioned EJE architects to design plans to refurbish the building for use as an inner city campus. Built in 1937, much of the building retains its original features, among them this cooking demonstration theatrette. The university proposes to house part of the music and law faculties and to use the top floors for accommodation. One concern is the lack of parking attached to the building. The, the Gibson Street car parking is, is within wa easy walking distance, um, as, as is the, the foreshore area. The plans will be considered by Newcastle City Council. With the launch set for early October, work on Sydney Showboat 2 is ahead of schedule and under budget. When finished, the showboat will weigh more than 500 tonnes and will be equivalent in height to a three-storey building. The funnels were recently positioned and the vessel is now looking more like the role it'll play as a cruising restaurant on Sydney Harbour. Newcastle won the building contract against national and international competition. The project has created 50 construction jobs. The boat will join Sydney Showboat One as the venue for four cabaret shows every day of the year. Loyal theatre buffs arrived at the Regal last night for a special screening. Since it opened in the early 1950s, thousands of moviegoers have enjoyed countless films from original carbon art projectors. To keep up with the times and popular demand, the old is making way for the new. We've had carbon arcs to produce the light source for the film through all that time and of course there's uh, carbon dust and powder and to handle the carbons and um, uh, it's a little bit messy. 
The $50,000 revamp will make life for the operator a little easier. Gone are the days of changing spools every 20 minutes. The new equipment will produce a, a brighter and sharper image on screen. I think the audience will be well aware of that. And we'll have uh, complete stereophonic sound and uh, audience participation sound. And it'll be state of the art. Customers say they come to enjoy the Regal's friendly atmosphere, one feature the owner doesn't plan to change. There's a sentimental side attached to all this. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you can't go through 25 years of working, working the theatre and with the equipment without um, uh, feeling a sense of um, uh, sadness at, at parting with it all. But it, it's all a new horizon and the, the future is um, something that I'm really looking forward to. It was a busy night for Lake Macquarie Council, high on the agenda the Glendale Shopping Centre which is proposed for this land off Lake Road. The Stockland Group is expected to lodge a building application in the near future, with the centre due to open around Christmas next year. Also discussed, whether or not to proceed with legal action against Warners Bay Company Electrozinc. According to a council report, the company polluted North Creek in February with high levels of cyanide detected in a nearby stormwater drain. The owner of the company, Stephen King, addressed council, refuting claims made by council officers in their report. And a first step toward establishing the city's newest suburb, with council granting approval to the engineering plans for a 43-lot subdivision at Pinney Beach. The move allows for the construction of an access road, as well as drainage and other preliminary works. But protesting against the decision are residents of nearby Swansea and Caves Beach. They believe council should have carried out a local environmental study before granting approval on the coastal land. Before any work begins on the subdivision, however, Developer Greg Moylan must seek the concurrence of the Director of Planning. Jody McKay, NBN News. Twenty-three-year-old Darren Tracy is a mild-mannered office worker during the week. On the weekend, he's one of the Winfield Cup's tough new young guns. The clash against Brisbane was the highlight of his career, and he admits to being a little shaky before the kickoff. Fairly nervous. Like when, on the, when I went on the field, I left my mouth guard in my dressing shed, and I didn't have a mouth guard. So my mind wasn't right on the job there. His selection in the Norwich Rising Star class, a team pick from the entire league, is a sign he's being recognised as a footballer of the future. Tracy used to play in the centres for Newcastle's western suburbs, then on the wing for the Knights reserves. He's played all year in first grade in the second row, a clip above the eye, a sign it can get tough in the engine room. Darren is thrilled to be in a pack of representative players. Like you're behind Sergeant and Harrigan and McCormack, to me, that's the best th th three combination up front I've ever seen. And it's just an honour to play behind them. The Knights have selected the side for the clash with South Sydney on Sunday at Marathon Stadium. After last weekend's brilliant form, only one change. Butterfield moves in from reserve grade onto the bench. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Another day on the job for carpenter Peter Rurich, but unlike the average tradesperson, Peter takes all his tools with him onto the site. The 40-year-old from Berkeley Vale on the Central Coast has invented the Wheelie Good Toolbox, and he thinks it's a winner. One company that I'm talking to at present sells $1.65 billion worth of toolboxes a year. 
His box of tricks can go upstairs or through doorways right to the job. Up to 100 kilos of gear can be moved with a minimum of fuss. On the job and all the tools are on hand, no need to run back to the truck, with Peter claiming a saving of up to an hour each day. He's still looking for the right manufacturer. He has applied for a world patent. The, uh, the hard part about it, any good idea is to get it into the marketplace. Peter Ryan, NBN News. It's arguably our greatest environmental problem. The greenhouse effect of the warming of the Earth's atmosphere could mean a change to the way in which we live. It is very serious in terms of the long-term implications. A meeting of experts at the Newcastle City Hall heard with the burning of fossil fuels, carbon dioxide gets trapped inside the Earth's atmosphere. Coal burning electricity generators are one of the worst offenders and that has serious implications for the Hunter Valley. Although experts say we should look at alternative fuels, it's uneconomic to make dramatic changes in the immediate future. Temperatures have risen half a degree in the last 100 years. Sea levels will rise up to 30 centimetres in the next 30 years. Rainfall will increase and there will be fewer frosts. If you keep changing the atmosphere, you will change the climate. The big debate will be about how much change can we tolerate before it's going to be really bad for us. And that will have great implications for agriculture. Peter Ryan, NBN News. There is an unusual vehicle on the road turning a few heads. It's a Commodore ambulance, a new look for the rescue service. The other vehicles are slowly wearing out and uh, the ambulance service has, has been evaluating uh, different types of vehicles to replace them. The Commodores, valued at around $50,000, will replace the old Ford F100s and F250s. The new cars are modified at JCAB at Tamworth. Ambulance officers say they have a good smooth ride and plenty of headroom. The service also has two prototypes. This GMC is being trialled also as a possible replacement vehicle. And this Hino rescue truck is also new. With all the latest features, it gives the service the opportunity to carry patients and equipment. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Well, what exactly is a family? A family is a group of, of people, perhaps living together, perhaps not, that provide nurturing and care and emotional support, financial support for those people that, that are, are members of that family. That broad definition hopes to draw as many people as possible to meetings like this one at Raymond Terrace. More than 150 will be held throughout the state as part of the Year of the Family to gauge what the public wants to do to help families. They really do want to have their say, to let us know what the issues are, but more importantly I think uh, to let us know what they believe are the ways in which we can strengthen families. It also tries to dispel any myth of an average family or a correct family, with only one in five having the stereotype of mum, dad and two children. 
It also aims to find solutions to the problems facing modern families, including childcare, unemployment and the breakdown of the family unit. Community groups and concerned citizens are encouraged to contribute to the program, which will form the basis of the State Government's family policy to be launched in November. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Despite shouldering a $2.6 million debt, Breakers Management today revealed Newcastle will have a side in the national competition this season and possibly more if they can prove financial viability. If we can prove that to the ASF, they will give back to us in writing confirmation that we are part of the National League for the next three years. Management hopes to achieve this through sponsorship. The club has given itself four weeks to raise the funds, enlisting a Central Coast public relations company to help. The target is $300,000. The means by selling sponsorship packages to the community and corporations. But that will go from $1,000 for a small business right through to maybe $100,000 for a large corporate business. So we're going to be putting family packs together for season ticket holders so that four or five kids and the, and the mum and dad can get together. In the immediate future, the Newcastle Knights have given permission for the Breakers to collect donations at Sunday's football game. But sponsorship is only one of three components believed vital to getting the Breakers back on track. Unsecured creditors also have to be persuaded to write off a $365,000 debt. According to Pat Clark, 85% have already agreed to do so. The club also has to offload its debt for the licensed premises and playing field. To achieve this, a consortium is being established. The consortium will consist of around 12 local business people and club members. Once officially formed next week, it will begin negotiating with the club's major creditor Westpac to buy the sporting facilities and licensed club. As for the team, Pat Clark says a coach will be announced within 10 days and a number of last season players have re-signed. Catherine Lamont, NBN News. Throsby Creek is a waterway that's been diagnosed as sick but on the improve. But exactly how healthy is it? That's the question environment and management student Jane Tinian intends to answer. But she steered away from traditional chemical testing methods. The established way of showing water pollution is to use chemical methods such as DO and pH, whereas this is a much more natural way. This includes looking at the creatures which live in the water and under the mudflats. The populations of minute organisms can give a reliable indication of the creek's overall condition. The survey started in March and has already produced some interesting results about the effect the surrounding environment has on the watercourse. During times of rainwater when a lot of um, urban runoffs coming into the creek that the populations are decreasing because pollution is more evident. With the help of Land and Environment Action Program students, the survey will continue until the end of the year. Meanwhile, the Kooragang Rehabilitation Project is doing its best to make our school children aware of the importance of waterways. More than 70 educational folders are being distributed to schools near estuaries, the first kit given to Stockton Primary School children. Although the handouts provide information on estuaries in general, eventually a chapter will be added to include characteristics unique to the hunter. We can send that around to the schools and they can put it in the book and they can have things that actually are unique to this estuary as well as learning about estuaries in general. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. The fire took hold of the building in a matter of minutes. The science, art, music and computer staff rooms and 15 general classrooms all destroyed. About three quarters of the school has been damaged, with smoke and heat also severely affecting the upper section of an adjacent building. 
At least 40 demountable classrooms are being set up at the site, the staff and students attempting to make the best of a bad situation. Very good. I mean, their morale is high, they have pitched into, into work and they're back doing their best with their studies. Year 12 students are already back at school and all other classes should return to normal next week. Police have charged a 21-year-old man with starting the fire. On a brighter note, Marks Point Primary School turns 40 today. The school staff and students have spent the day celebrating. They also took time to remember days gone by. Emma Siossian, NBN News. It's a scene you'd see in every town on most Saturdays. Thousands flocking to netball courts to play the sport they love. While many participate in the mainstream game, there's a growing brigade partaking in the People with Disabilities competition. PWDs, as it's affectionately known, is a mixed contest, played Australia-wide, which has its own national championships. In Newcastle, the movement has been going since 1986. Frankie Vandenberg in the green shorts plays for the western suburb Scorpions and he doesn't half enjoy it. The rules may be slightly relaxed but there's certainly no restraint on enthusiasm. It's all about getting a little exercise, learning teamwork but mostly having fun. The reason why Barbara Kaiser loves to coach them. Just the satisfaction of seeing them enjoy themselves and um, to see them in sport. With the season up to the semi-final stage the Scorpions take things seriously, training once a week. Friendship is a major motivator to keeping the group, whose ages range from 15 to 43, together. Kylie Miles is the baby. Her disabilities, which include cerebral palsy and being paralysed down the left side, eased with a smile. I'm a goal shooter. <laughs> and you don't miss too many goals? No, no, I scored about 10. Every team has a personality and 24-year-old Frankie is the Scorpions. The vitality with which he and the others participate could teach many of us a lesson. The way they play the game, there's never any crosswords through a game. They just get on with it. Uh, with the opposition, um, they walk off, they shake hands, they laugh. They enjoy it. There's no hassles from parents from the sideline. They just stand there. Everybody enjoys. With the Australian Baseball League season due to kick off in October, competition newcomers the Hunter Eagles are busy finalising their recruitments. Some Hunter and Sydney players already signed were in Newcastle today getting a feel for the region. The Eagles will have a squad of 30. A minimum of 16 of those will be from the team's drawing area, which stretches inland from Armidale, north to Grafton and Hawkesbury in the south. With 17 already contracted, 25 players from around the region will be trialling tomorrow for the remaining positions. The Eagles have affiliated with Canadian team the Montreal Expos, currently placed in the top five in the American Baseball League. Four of the local side's players will come from the Expos. What happens is that they send over uh, four players. We'll be getting two starting pitchers, a coach, uh, a coach uh, an assistant coach, um, a catcher and a third baseman.
The team will be young by ABL standards, the average age 22. Despite this, Ray Powell believes the team boosted by the overseas expertise will be competitive. And as for the ability of the region to support a national team whose home ground will be Marathon Stadium... Newcastle is traditional in terms of its uh, uh, allegiance to national sports and uh, this is so different and it's in summer, there's uh, only the soccer that's on in here uh, in the summertime. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. Jim Rose and his circus sideshow are back in Australia with a new range of tricks and stunts set to amaze. They are in Newcastle promoting their Monsters of Danger and Women of Wonder tour. The event is being dubbed the most dangerous circus show ever seen. We are professionals. We only have four or five accidents a year. We do 240 shows, so we're pretty proud of that. Features of the circus include acts by the Armenian rubber man, Mark the Knife and of course Jim himself. Jim says the show's appeal lies in the unusual nature of the acts. We're humans and you're a human and when a, a human can do something another human can't it creates interest. After tonight's show in Newcastle, the team will visit major centres around the country. Emma Ossian, NBN News. This meeting at Broadmeadow late yesterday, which set the path officers around the state would follow. Most people would not have been aware of the industrial action in the region. Officers carried out their normal tasks, including attending two break and enters in Hunter Street. A hairdresser's and Asian bazaar were broken into overnight. Cash was stolen from one of the premises. For the public doing business at local stations, there were notices explaining the industrial action, but according to Association Representative Mark Burgess, there were few, if any, complaints, and in general, the community was highly supportive. In fact, today, even I, wor I was working and uh, driving around the streets of Newcastle, surprising how many people sang out and waved to us. Yeah, it's been great. Local firefighters, meanwhile, are following their state counterparts and embarking on industrial action. While all emergency calls will be answered, there will be bans on paperwork. Joining police and firefighters in their push for a wage increase are local ambulance officers. They last night rejected an enterprise agreement which would have seen them receive a pay increase of 9%. We haven't really come to a firm figure, but we're probably looking around about the 12 to 15% to, as a starting basis for negotiations. Also rejected, a plan to introduce part-time ambulance officers. The union claims there are at least 40 more full-time officers needed in the Hunter. They're asking for talks with the Minister Ron Phillips. But if that doesn't occur, then they too will be flexing their industrial muscle. Which will probably be inactivated probably in two to three weeks period of time, which will mean that uh, we'll probably be only be doing emergency work only. <laughs> 